Good evening and welcome to Socrates in the City. I'm thrilled to see so many of you here. Um, usually we only have such a big crowd when we have a really great speaker. And tonight I know in advance, Baroness Cox, she's never spoken in public before. She's terribly, terribly shy, really painfully shy. And I said, look, you're never gonna get over it unless you, you, know, you give it a shot. So she said, okay, Eric, I, I will. And uh, we've been in prayer and uh, is she here? Yes, she's here. But this is really, um, it is so, it's very heartening and very encouraging to see so many uh, of you here. Uh, I wanna thank you for being a part of Socrates in the City. Um, as you know, or as I hope you know, Socrates in the City uh, takes its name from Socrates, thank you, uh, who said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Are you authorized to do that, sir? Are you on the staff? Well, then take your hands off the equipment and step back from the vehicle. Um, uh, so, um, Baroness, is that okay with you? I don't know who that is. I think people are just going to come up and do stuff here. I don't know, evidently. Maybe, maybe somebody will come up and start painting the podium a different color because they don't like brown. Uh, feel, feel free. It's a private club. Um, so, um, <clears throat> any, anybody else? You want to change the lighting? Or maybe take some of the paintings down because they offend you. Yeah. Yeah. Six Semper Tyrannus. Take that down. Uh, the... Um, in any case, uh, Socrates in the City uh, asks the big questions because Socrates famously said the unexamined life is not worth living. And about 11 years ago, uh, a number of friends and I thought it would be fun uh, to have a venue in New York City where we asked the big, difficult questions, the questions that tend not to get asked uh, in places like New York City, uh, questions about life, God, and other small topics, the kind of questions that could make you very, very uncomfortable and will make you uncomfortable tonight. I'm just gonna pause so you could feel uncomfortable. It's creepy, isn't it? Who knows what we'll say? Who knows what we're selling, Baroness Cox? Who knows? It's very frightening, and you're in the room, you're trapped, you can't leave easily. Um, all right, enough joking for the evening. Honestly, we are uh, in for such a treat tonight. We get to hear uh, Baroness uh, Caroline Cox, AKA Lady Caroline, also known to um, her close friend, says Ducky. Uh, even she doesn't know that, L lady, lady Ducks, yes? Um, but um, we are going to hear from a real-life baroness this evening. And it is true, she does look down her nose at commoners <laughs> like yourselves. You'll notice I didn't say she looks down on commoners like ourselves, because some of you would know this, but I am a Viscount. Uh, some of you don't even know what a Viscount is but that only underscores your embarrassing commonness. <laughs> but the Baroness, of course, knows precisely what a Viscount is, and I dare say it's why she and I get on so famously. We, uh, we aristocrats, uh, we understand each other, don't we, Ducky? We do. Uh, we, uh, we really do. It's a special club. Uh, we're part of a small group, an accountability group. We pray together with, uh, with just the two of us and uh, Sir John Polkinghorne, right? Yes, who's a knight of the British Empire. We just sort of hang out and just love on each other. Uh, that's what we do, yeah, we, we do that. And uh, the spirit really uh, moves. We're seeing healings and gold fillings and all kinds of stuff. And, but the best thing in this little group that we have is that there are no commoners, isn't it, Ducky? That's, the, that's really the best thing, just the three of us, you, me, and uh, Polkinghorne. Um, okay, let me try and tell you uh, substantively uh, what the, this uh, wonderful woman, uh, who she is and some of the things she's done. Uh, I don't want to go into it too much just because it's, uh, it'll overwhelm you. I hope you will go back to the website after this evening and uh, read. Uh, there's a little bit of a longer bio there or at the end of the evening avail yourself of this new biography of Baroness Cox. It is a tremendous story. You'll just get a little bit about it um, tonight. Uh, where to start? Uh, when uh, the Baroness was not yet a Baroness, uh, she was um, a student uh, in London, and I hope she'll tell us a little bit about this tonight, but uh, she found that the uh, Marxist-Leninism was so powerful that merely not to be a Marxist-Leninist in that uh, world in the 70s in uh, the academic world of London uh, was itself nearly impossible, and she was very heroic uh, in battling that uh, 
At the time, she wrote a book about that experience called The Rape of Reason, uh, describing the tactics of the people uh, who were uh, persecuting her and making life uh, difficult. Um, as a result of that, uh, Lady Thatcher, uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, made um, Caroline Cox a, uh, a baroness, and I hope she will, she'll tell you about that. Um, she was created a life peer, that's the term in 1982. She's been deputy speaker of the House of Lords in the UK since 1985. She was founding chancellor of Bournemouth University from 1991 to 2001 and is vice president of the Royal College of Nursing. Uh, many of you know of her humanitarian work. I hope we'll hear about that tonight. It includes serving as non-executive director of the Andrei Sakharov Foundation and the Siberian Medical University, and also she's the chief executive of Heart Humanitarian Aid Relief Trust. Uh, do we have a representative of Heart here tonight? Donna Mundy, are you here? Raise your hand. Okay, yes, there she is. If you're interested in hearing about Heart, and there's information on the table out there. We just don't have time, or at least I don't have time, but I promise you, an extraordinary humanitarian organization. Baroness Cox has been honored with the Commander Cross of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland uh, and the Wilberforce Award for her humanitarian work. She's been awarded an honorary fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons of England and honorary doctorates by universities in the UK, the US, the Russian Federation, and Armenia, and you probably didn't know this, uh, Baroness, but I've just begun work on my honorary doctorate. <laughs> it's true, in earnest, I really, I'm really hitting the books. Um, her humanitarian work has taken her on many, many dangerous missions uh, to conflict zones, including Armenia, the Sudan, Nigeria, the Burmese jungles, and Indonesia. She's had her life threatened uh, many times and almost lost her life a few times. She's recently visited North Korea to help promote parliamentary initiatives and medical programs, and she's been instrumental in helping change policies for orphaned and abandoned children in the former Soviet Union. Um, she's a brave uh, woman, and she is a lonely, but as I say, brave voice speaking up about uh, Sharia law in the UK, uh, daring uh, to defy political correctness and speak up about um, militant and aggressive Islamism, not Islam, as she'll explain, but Islamism. Uh, would that there were more like her, but praise the Lord that there are a few, and thank the Lord that there is Baroness Cox and that she's with us this evening. So a warm Socrates in the city welcome, if you would, for Baroness Caroline Cox. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. I'm thrilled to be here in spite of Eric. Eric, <laughs> I've gone off you big time. But it is a great, great privilege to be hosted by Socrates in the City. I've got unbounded admiration for all you do. And it's a great delight to have your hospitality. You mention that word hospitality always reminds me a little uncomfortably of a definition of hospitality once suggested by one of our late archbishops of Canterbury, Lord Coggan, who defined hospitality as the art of making someone feel at home when you wish they were at home. <laughs> well, we all know that feeling, and I do warn you, Eric, in spite of everything, you've made me feel at home here. I hope you won't be wishing I were at home by the end of the evening, because I am actually going to share a rather challenging message. But just before I embark upon the challenges, I'd like to introduce myself a little more modestly than Eric's introduction. That all I ever say about myself, and it's all I ever say about myself, who authorized you to do that? Thank you. <laughs> Is, as you may have... <laughs> all I ever say about myself, and all I ever say about myself, in spite of interruptions going on and distractions, and if you break the bowel, Beric, you're not my favorite person. <laughs> now what have you done? <laughs> have you... Can I just ask you? Oh, thank you very much. Would you like to sit down and stay seated? Thank you very much. <laughs> is that I'm, my introduction is I'm a nurse and a social scientist by intention. That's what I thought I was doing in my life. I'm a baroness by astonishment. And I wasn't born a baroness at all. Um, in fact, I was so much out of that world that I was the first baroness I'd ever met. 
I've met one before. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> I can tell you, it's really quite sort of challenging. You become a baroness by being appointed to our British upper house, the House of Lords, which is the equivalent of your Senate. And that's how you get a title, you become part of the nobility. And you wake up one morning and you find a baroness looking at yourself out of the mirror. And you think, well, what do I do with this being a baroness? Well, it occurred to me that one of the ways I could use that great privilege, and of course it is a privilege, to be able to speak in one of the houses of the British Parliament was to be a voice for the voiceless. To be able to speak for people who cannot speak for themselves, whether as a nurse or a social scientist on behalf of vulnerable people in our own country, but increasingly on behalf of forgotten peoples in forgotten lands, and so many of those suffering persecution around the world today, and so many of those increasingly at the hands of militant Islam. So, very briefly, um, I want to talk tonight about challenges to our spiritual, cultural, and political heritage, both in the UK and abroad. But we must remember, and in this room, in this place, it's so important to remember that we have our freedoms today because over the centuries other people gave their lives that we should have our freedoms. And we have to pass those freedoms on undiminished to our children and our grandchildren. And we have that responsibility in our day. And I may say at the moment, I think in Britain, we are not doing very well. The challenges are many from within and without. And they've combined to create a situation in which it's been said by one of our Anglican bishops, whom I have a great respect, Bishop Michael Nazar Ali, who's Pakistani by background and understands the subject we're talking about tonight. He said, Britain has lost its soul. Some of the contributing factors, aggressive secular humanism, some may re relate to your country, some are more acute in Britain, a misplaced multiculturalism and extreme relativism, Anything goes. We dare not say anything about any other culture that is less or more good than any other culture. Anything goes. We mustn't offend at any, any price. A deep ignorance because of our education system, of our spiritual, cultural, and political heritage. Young people leaving school, disillusioned, disaffected. Life is boring. And as far as our churches are concerned, I think perhaps even more in your country, divisions within the Christian churches, especially in your country, in the Episcopalian church, which is deeply, deeply disturbing and a distraction from the main issues. So the trumpet is giving an uncertain call. The contributing factors, the extreme relativism and the hedonism of the flower power in the swinging 60s. Most of you here probably won't remember that, but I remember it only too well and the very extreme, systematic, and formidable <clears throat> excuse me, Marxist-Leninist influences in education in the 70s and the 80s. <clears throat> I was heading a department of social sciences in one of our big London colleges. Out of a faculty of 20, 16 of my colleagues were Communist Party or further left, the really aggressive, hardline far left. What they were about was certainly not what my view of higher education is. For me, higher education is freedom to pursue the truth within the canons of academic rigor. For them, it was hard line indoctrination. Academic blackmail, physical assaults, we had violent occupations of our buildings quite regularly, physically attacked, character assassination, hard line stuff. It was a faculty that was worse than most of the students. And I was so worried by what I saw going on around me, knowing that it wasn't only happening in my college, it was happening throughout the soft underbelly of higher education throughout Britain, in the social sciences, in teacher education, in the arts and liberal studies, in social work training. And it was having a very dangerous, subversive effect. And the thing that really got me most of all was what it actually did to students. Students would come fresh-faced, open-minded, just good, decent, lovely students. But if they got converted to communism, then you could see that their whole being would change. It was like Faust. So obviously they'd lose their souls. You could no longer have rational dialogue. They developed what I could only call the physiognomy of hatred. I remember one of my staff colleagues uh, became a member of the Communist Party, and his wife phoned me up, absolutely desperate. And she was a good friend of mine. We'd done our master's degrees together. She said, can I come and talk to you? And I said, of course, Rosie. She, she came to my home. She didn't dare be seen talking to me in the college. And she said, I don't know what to do. Kevin's become a member of the Communist Party, and he's been told that either I have to join the Communist Party or he has to divorce me. What do I do? 
It was really hard line stuff. That was just one example. I'm not going down that road tonight because we've got other things to talk about. But that really alerted me to the realities of totalitarianism and its methods. One of the things which our Communist Party friends did, we're reaping the whirlwind now. They would use academic blackmail, they would indoctrinate, and what they taught was a constant erosion of any appreciation of what is valuable and precious in our political and cultural and spiritual heritage. It was anti-religion, anti-family, very, very anti-American, I'm sorry about that, anti-capitalist, and students were left in a complete miasma of having no values, <clears throat> a sea of relativism. And once they converted the hardline students and they'd become Communist Party members, they then would sit in staff meetings and I sat there. And they would decide where they would feed those out into the wider society. Of course, the ideologically converted students got the good degrees. They got the first class honors and the upper seconds. The others were given the lower degrees. And then they said, OK, we'll put the student into teacher education, that student into social work, that into media studies. And now we're reaping the whirlwind that so many of the key people in those branches of our society now are the products of that generation with no values and with this vacuum, spiritual, moral vacuum. I was so concerned about what I saw going on that with two colleagues, I wrote a book. Um, they were not from the, the sort of world into the sociology department. They were from the relatively sane parts of physics and mathematics. But we were all part of the same college. But I had to go back and face the music. I wasn't going to write and run. So the book was published, and I was a bit nervous about going back to facing all those uh, hardline, very, very ruthless colleagues. But the day before the book was due to be published, I was getting the kids ready for school, and my husband called upstairs and said, the name won't mean much to you, but was very significant in Britain at that time. Bernard Levin is on the phone. Now, Bernard Levin was a journalist, an analyst, and he had three articles a week in the London Times. That is influence. And he was on the phone. I'd never met him. He said, I've just read your book. I think it's the most important book for the future of democracy that I've read for the last 10 years. I'm going to cover it in tomorrow's times. It was an absolute godsend. It was a lifesaver. The day the book came out, I got a copy of the Times, and there on the page opposite the editorials was this huge article with a wonderful strap line, in all its brutality, the making of an intellectual concentration camp. And at the end, he said, because I think this is such an important book for the future of democracy, I'm going to devote my re remaining two articles this week to discussing it. So he gave us a trilogy, which he'd only ever done before for Mozart and Solzhenitsyn. So we're in good company. <laughs> but it saved my life, and I think that's why Margaret Thatcher appointed me to the House of Lords as a kind of freedom fighter. But we are reaping the whirlwind. The result, many people now in Britain do not believe we have anything worth defending or anything which they feel might need to be deterred. We're in this sort of sea of relativism and political correctness and extreme multiculturalism. And we know where there is a vacuum, it's liable to be filled, and with alternative ideologies, belief systems, and role models. One alternative belief system, which is introducing beliefs and practices incompatible with the principles and values of our political and cultural heritage, is political and militant Islam or Islamism. Now, so I'm going to get focused, so I just want to ask, can you all understand me? I know English is your second language, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but can you understand me? I'm not talking too fast for you. No, okay because it's going to get serious. <laughs> Large swig of wine. Strategic, political, militant Islam is, I believe, the greatest threat, not only in Britain, but worldwide, wherever we have liberal democracies and our own faith systems to up economic, political, spiritual, and cultural heritage. That's the baseline of my talk tonight. I have to emphasize that as far as individuals are concerned, the vast majority of the world's 1.2 billion or so Muslims are law-abiding, hospitable people. The block of flats, the apartment I live in in London, I've got an Afghan family above, above me, an Afghan family um, on the same floor, and they are gracious, charming people. Individual Muslims are gracious, charming, hospitable people, most of them. 
However, there is a growth of militant Islamists and politically strategic Muslims who are working to achieve global domination by various strategies. Where possible, we must extend hands of friendships to Muslims who are seeking to live peaceably and or to redefine Islam in terms of peaceful coexistence and religious tolerance. I did have an opportunity to do that in Indonesia when I was in Indonesia when Laska Jihad attacked some of the areas of Indonesia, um, the Malakas and Sulawesi. They came in huge numbers, thousands, Laska Jihad from Pakistan, from uh, the Middle East, and it was a horrendous conflict and many, many hundreds were killed and many thousands were displaced. But the traditional, uh, the sort of the long-standing local Muslim leaders who had allowed the Christians and the Hindus to live peacefully didn't really want this. And after two and a half years, they wanted to normalize relations with the um, other faith communities. Hard to do in the conflict zones because Laska Jihad was there intimidating them. But I had the opportunity um, to set up or help set up in Jakarta an organization with an endless name called the International Islamic Christian Organization for Reconciliation and Reconstruction which mercifully abbreviates to i -Corps. And the former and now late president of Indonesia, Abdurrahman Wahid, was our honorary president of i -Corps. And I was pleased when the British government funded an interfaith delegation to come to the UK to work out principles of reconciliation and reconstruction away from the conflict zone. When they returned back to Ambon in the Moluccas, they were able to con uh, contain incipient conflict. And so far, there's been relative peace in that part of Indonesia. And I met some Indonesian parliamentarians just in the summer, and they said that peace has held. Now, the kind of Islam in Indonesia is a kind of Islam which has allowed peaceful coexistence. And I think there is a Wahid Institute here in the, the States. And if people are trying to work within Islam to develop a peaceful uh, coexistence form of Islam, then we must support and encourage them. That is very, very important, because they are going to be vulnerable, they are going to be isolated very often, and they may well be in danger. But it's not on the whole those Muslims who are driving the international agenda of strategic uh, attempts to uh, contain, to conquer the world. Political Islam is using various strategies. Legal, economic, political, cultural, humanitarian aid, demographic, and military. Let's get going. Hold on to your seatbelts, please. As far as Britain is concerned, the introduction of aspects of Sharia law into the United Kingdom. We already have Sharia law in the UK. We have at least 60 uh, Sharia courts. Some aspects, I'd say, have already been introduced into the UK. It is utterly unacceptable. It violates the fundamental principles on which British legal system is based, including equality before the law, as between men and women, between Muslims and non-Muslims, and it also denies freedom to choose and to change religion. It's come, it's with us. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. As I said, there are over 80 Sharia courts, and the particular fundamental tenets of Sharia law which I'm focusing on at the moment, are inherently discriminatory against women. Many women in Britain today are suffering to such an extent that they claim their plight is worse than in the countries from which they came. The gender discrimination. Some examples of the inherent discrimination. Inheritance provisions. Girls and women in a Sharia court under Sharia rulings only receive one half of any legacy given to boys and to men inequality in access to divorce. A husband can unilaterally and easily divorce his wife, sometimes merely by declaring that divorce three times. For a wife who wants to divorce her husband, numerous constraints apply. She may have to obtain her husband's permission. She may have to apply to a Sharia council or court for a ruling. She may have to pay money for this. She may have to ask her husband for that money. It can be very difficult for the woman to get a divorce. Polygamy. A man who divorces his wife is entitled to marry again. Under Sharia law, is permitted four wives. A divorced wife may not remarry without conditions. Now, I've spoken to so many Muslim women in Britain who have been divorced. Their husbands have gone back to their countries of origin, come back with another wife. And they often tell me how the husbands, when they go and seek a new bride back in their countries of origin, may often go to the villages, to rural areas, to find a bride, a girl, who is uneducated, 
who certainly is illiterate, so when she comes to Britain, she will have no way of finding her way in society, of being access her legal rights in the United Kingdom. They're deliberately vulnerable, and many are living a kind of Taliban-like existence immured in their homes in Britain today. Custody of children. Children born to a woman who is divorced are legally, according to Sharia law, liable to be placed in the father's care from the age of seven years. So a woman may lose her husband and lose her children. Rape. If a woman wants to bring a charge of alleged rape, she's obliged to provide so easy to find, isn't it? Four independent male witnesses. But it's there for real. Domestic violence. Husband is allowed to beat his wife, subject to certain limitations like where it doesn't show, sanctioning domestic violence. Unequal witnesses. In any Sharia court, a woman's evidence is counted as half the value of the man's. And unregistered marriages. So many marriages, so-called religious marriages, taking place in the Sharia courts and councils in Britain, which are not registered in English law, so they're not registered civil marriages. And this is very dangerous for those women. It makes them very vulnerable. And I just quote, many women in Muslim communities in Britain believe, and men who know better can benefit by failing to correct their error, that a marriage in a mosque or before imams in Britain constitutes a valid marriage. In the event of a dispute, an attempt to enforce their rights through the British courts, they're shocked to discover that unless married in one of the very few mosques registered for a civil ceremony, they're not validly married in the eyes of British law. I asked a question in the House of Lords not so long ago to the minister. What happens to these wives if they are divorced and to their children? What redress do they have in the British legal system? The minister had no reply. They don't have any. They're totally vulnerable. And intimidation. The long arm of intimidation. A quote from another very good little book by our think tank Civitas. The reality is that for many Muslims, Sharia courts are in practice part of an institutionalized atmosphere of intimidation backed by the ultimate sanction of a death threat. This is Britain today. Just a couple of case studies. Just sit with me for a moment and talk to one of the Muslim ladies I'm talking to in London. Now, I won't give her country of origin because I don't want that long arm of intimidation to go back and affect her family. But she is a lovely, beautiful young woman. She suffered horrendous domestic violence. She was so badly injured in domestic violence, she was hospitalized. Her husband wouldn't give the hospital her passport. He didn't want anyone getting hold of her passport in case she got it back. He just gave the passport details. The community put tremendous pressure on her not to take her case to the police. So couldn't prosecute, she couldn't get police protection. When she got home eventually, and she went to her imam at the local Sharia court to ask for help, she was just told, well, the family is all important, just go back and give your husband a second chance, again and again. Eventually, she fled, but she wanted to remarry. Her husband divorced her, and she found a place in a refuge. She wanted to remarry, she wanted to try to get a life. She went to the Sharia court. The imam said, you've got to get your marriage certificate. Well, the marriage certificate was with her husband, her ex-husband. So she did contact him and said she wanted her marriage certificate. She wanted to get married again. He'd already got another bride back in Britain. Well, the marriage certificate was apparently back in his home, in his country of origin. So her family out there went to his family in that country to try and get the marriage certificate. Instead of giving her the marriage certificate, they beat up her younger brother because she had brought shame on the family back in Britain by wanting to divorce her husband. So intimidated totally her family. So she can't get a marriage certificate, she can't marry, she can't get a divorce. This has been going on for over seven years and the years are ticking by and the biological time clock kicks in and she is desperate. Just one other, I could tell you so many. I was talking to a more elderly lady not so long ago and she was absolutely furious with frustration. She was widowed. She wanted to remarry, so she went to the Sharia court and the imam said, well, you've got to have the permission of a male relative. She said, I haven't got one. Uh, my only male relative in this country was my husband and he's died. Well, you've got to find a male relative somewhere to get permission before you can remarry. This is a grandmother. She's <laughs> widowed, a widowed grandmother. Well, the only relative she could think of was a seven-year-old grandson living in Jordan. She had to trail off to Jordan to get the written permission from her seven-year-old grandson to get remarried in Britain. 
And I've seen a copy of that little Arabic letter in this child writing. How humiliating for a grandmother in Britain to have to get a seven-year-old grandson's permission to remarry as a widow. I can give you so many, and so many of these case studies relate to women who have really suffered and whose condition should come under grievous bodily harm and police protection. But they go to their Sharia courts, they're told to go back and give their husbands another chance, and the community puts such pressure on them not to report to the police because it would bring shame on the community. These women are desperate. It goes back to that saying I mentioned earlier on, we're worse off in this country we came here to try and get away from Sharia law. We're worse off here than we were back at home. And this is happening in Britain today. What are we trying to do about it? Well, I've introduced a private member's bill into the House of Lords. It's called the Arbitration and Mediation Services Equality Bill. Because I thought one of the ways in which we could get discussion in the political arena, responsible, sensitive discussion, was actually to introduce some legislation. And the best way to begin to get this issue discussed was to try to look at the gender discrimination and the actual suffering of women in Britain today. So this is what this bill is focusing on. And we've got a broad coalition, and it's very important when working in the political arena, and I'm happy to say we've got a lot of support. We have church leaders, not our present Archbishop of Canterbury, unfortunately, yet. Um, but the former Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, Bishop Michael Nazar Ali, amongst the church leaders, the National Secular Society, a very good group, one law for all. A lot of those are ex-Muslims. Various actual Muslim groups, particularly those representing women's rights and also British Muslims for secular democracy, and human rights groups working with women affected by Sharia-based discrimination, where the women go for help when they are suffering so much. So we have the broad-based coalition, but the bill is due for its second reading in March of next year, and we're building up, I hope, a very strong case to try to get the government support for it. Whether we do or not, we watch this space. Anyhow, that's one example of where Islam is affecting our legal system and is operating its own incompatible legal system in tandem, but in Britain today. Economic strategies. The West is already compromised by the introduction in countries like Britain of Sharia banking and Sharia finance. Although it may seem harmless, it's extremely insidious. A lot of the money which is taken in tithes instead of um, paying your um, interest is suspected and some has been shown possibly to be used for purposes is not transparent. This concern it may go off to be supporting jihads. It's also designed ultimately to undermine the strength of Western currency and eventually to bring down the Western capitalist system. Very good books by people like Rachel Ehrenfeld who document this extremely well. Political, Islam is using the freedoms of democracy to destroy democracy and the freedoms it enshrines. For example, in Britain, there were attempts to use proposed incitement, religious incitement legislation to destroy fundamental freedoms of speech. Now, this is a few years ago, and there was a big bill going through Parliament. It was a serious organised crimes bill. It was a complicated bill, and it was near the end of a parliamentary session. There was great pressure to get it through quickly. What was not clear on the face of the bill, but if you could read between the lines, you could discern it, was if that bill had gone through unamended, it would have been a criminal offence, punishable by up to seven years in prison, to say anything critical about Islam, to proselytize or say anything positive about another religion, because that would give offence, or to make jokes about Islam. Well, fortunately, in the House of Lords, we were able to discern that implicit legislation, and we moved or we put forward a number of amendments to protect those fundamental freedoms. Now, we knew we'd have a lot of opposition. For anyone who's tried to do anything in the field of criticizing Islam, we know that one of the things you're liable to get criticized for is racism. So, advance of second reading, which is the first stage of our legislation when it gets discussed in Parliament, I got the leaders of the black churches together we had a good meeting in the House of Lords. And many of them, of course, have come from countries which have Sharia law. And many have come to get freedom in Britain. It didn't take them very long to realize what was at stake. Well, that was on a Thursday afternoon. The second reading, the, next, the phase of the bill when it would be discussed, was the next Monday. I arrived at Parliament, and to my amazement, 
I just suddenly saw this huge mass demonstration of wonderful black people with banners saying all the things that they should say, like freedom to choose and change religion, you know, freedom of speech. And they weren't chanting, they were singing. Amazing grace, it took off the clouds, it was fantastic. But I also saw the police vans coming because it was an unauthorized demonstration. So I went up to the senior police officer and I said, um, officer, um, I do apologize. I think um, I may have something to do with this. And he said, well, you're, this is your demonstration, is it? And I said, well, no, officer, it's actually the voice of the people. I only had a meeting last Thursday and this happened today. Well, I said, but I promise you, officer, there will be no trouble at all. And so the police vans went away. There was a peaceful demonstration with wonderful singing. They left the place tidier than they found it. The police, it was the best demonstration they'd had to observe for many years. And consequently, when we needed subsequent demonstrations for later stages in the bill, we always got permission. But it also meant I could stand up in the House of Lords and say, there is nothing racist about these amendments. Look who's demonstrating outside. We also had another broad-based coalition of trying to protect these freedoms of speech. These are fundamental freedoms of speech for which people have died that we have these freedoms. Some of you may know Mr. Bean, Rowan Atkinson. Well, he was one of our people at our briefing sessions. I, I can tell you, he was not in the least bit funny. He was deadly serious. Anyhow, the amendments were put on in the House of Lords, called them the Freedom Amendments. When the bill went to the House of Commons, because uh, all legislation has to go through both houses, Tony Blair's administration, under great pressure, we believe, from the Muslim Council of Britain, were determined to remove the Lord's Freedom Amendments. Well, the black churches all demonstrated again and sang again, and before the votes were taken in the House of Commons to remove the House of Lords amendments, uh, some of the black church leaders went and lobbied some of the Labour members of Parliament. They changed the minds of nine. When the critical votes came to remove these freedom amendments, the first vote was lost by 10 votes, then the whips got to work, and Britain's freedom hung by a thread that night. The second vote, the final vote to remove the Lord's Amendments was lost by one vote. One vote. God is a good mathematician, but our freedom hung by a thread. And they won't stop there. These kind of debates are going on now in the United Nations. There will be more and more attempts to clamp down on freedom of speech. That was a, was a victory, uh, but a temporary one. But it was an important one cultural strategies. Islam is investing massively in education in Western countries, for example, in universities, even in theological colleges, centers of Islamic study, and schools. That investment will clearly tend to neutralize any critical teaching about Islam, will tend to influence staff or faculty appointments, and of course will influence discussions of controversial issues like the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Islamic investment in schools, especially Islamic schools, has been used to teach virulent, anti-Semitic, anti-Western views, as well as hatred of Christianity, Judaism, America, and the West in general. There was a fascinating film shown on our Channel 4 um, on the B in British television, which an undercover um, filming of what happened in one of the Islamic schools. And it showed in some of the teaching, I mean, really rabid anti-Semitism, anti-Hinduism, interestingly, and in some of the free periods, ferocious violence of older children uh, and older boys really brutally teaching younger children. What was particularly worrying was that that school had recently had um, an inspection from our official government body that's meant to be monitoring all schools to make sure they adhere to appropriate standards. And it got a remarkable, excellent rating for tolerance. We do need to be vigilant. Some Muslims try to deter critical discussions of Islam by accusing those engaged in discussion of Islamophobia and contravening political correctness. One knows one may well get the stigma. Demographic strategies in countries such as Britain, many Muslims, as I already said, have polygamous marriages. In particular, many Muslim men use that relatively easy access to divorce available under Sharia law to divorce their wives and to remarry, bringing their new wives to the UK not only that it often caused great distress to their previous wives, it's inconsistent with our legal system, which forbids polygamy, but because they haven't had a formally registered, civil registered legal marriage, they're not committing bigamy. 
and it also has implications for our demographic structure. It was said recently that the most frequently used name for newborn boys in Britain now is Mohammed. So what to do? What to do on the home front? We must draw a line in the sand where necessary to protect those fundamental freedoms. I've given you a couple of examples where we're trying to do that, and also the vulnerable citizens, and provide education so our younger generation can appreciate our heritage of freedom. We also need to look out, to look beyond our limited and limiting horizons to see the wider world and our problems in perspective, to wake up and understand those dangers which confront us which are not only limited to us. Very briefly, I'm going to invite you to travel to where we're working with some of our partners abroad on those front lines of faith and freedom who are facing these challenges in very formidable and often lethal ways. The challenges here, demographic, humanitarian, and military strategies. In developing countries, Muslims are using polygamy quite explicitly as a way of changing the demographic structure. In Uganda, a senior official said to one of the Christian leaders in Kampala, that's fine, you stay with your monogamy, that suits us fine, we will practice our polygamy. Every Muslim can marry four wives who will each have eight children, so one Muslim man will produce over 30 children and this way will take over your country. That was said in, in Uganda, in Kampala, quite explicitly. Islam is also investing massively economically in developing countries. Economic power brings political power. Islamic employment policy often requires non-Muslims to convert to Islam in order to get employment. Again, talking to some of the senior people in Uganda, they were describing how Islam has taken over um, by investment nearly all the kind of corporate and state enterprises and is employing this Islamic employment policy, which means if you're a graduate from a um, secular or a Christian university, you want a job, you have to convert to Islam. Of course, your wife and family don't need to, but we all know what happens if the man does. And there is a lot of concern out there, but also economic power brings political power. And one particular church leader said to us, while Islam invests for mission, as long as capitalism only invests for profit, Islam will win economically. We've got to get together. We've got to look, not just what's happening on our own doorsteps. If Africa goes, there are going to be very far-reaching implications to the rest of the world. And I put this to uh, quite a senior person, businessman in the city of London. I said, any chance that you know, Christian or non-Muslim uh, business might invest in countries like Africa just for the sake of making sure that we have a presence there, an investment presence? He said, forget it. The only talk in the city of London is Mumbai, Shanghai, and Dubai. Any Christian business people or people who care about freedom, can we think or be aware that Islam is investing for mission? And as long as we only invest for profit, we're going to give the game away. We're going to lose those economic arenas. Islam is also investing massively in Sudan and other developing countries in humanitarian aid. And humanitarian aid is conditional. In southern Sudan, Christian leaders have a copy of a paper. It's a budget designed for the Islamization of southern Sudan. It's all their teacher training colleges, schools, hospitals, clinics. 29 million US. That went to Saudi Arabia, went to Libya. That money's been pouring in. Islamic aid, as I say, is conditional. Dawah Islamia, one of the biggest aid organizations, means conversion. And church leaders down in southern Sudan say, we're losing in peace what we managed to hang on to, such terrible cost in war. Islamic aid is everywhere. Where is Christian aid or some of the more secular, unconditional aid organizations? Very briefly, travel with me and just feel some of this, feel the heat on your skin, see the people. Sudan, I love Sudan. I've worked there many, many years. And particularly during the war, Sudan has suffered um, very tragic conflict for most of the years since independence. But the situation became dramatically worse in 89 when an Islamist regime took power by military coup and immediately declared military jihad against all who opposed it. The military jihad led to a war in which two million perished and four million were displaced. Every month, Khartoum used to publish a list of those airstrips in the south that were open to UN Operation Lifeline Sudan and all the legitimate aid organizations and the no-go areas. And it would carry out its military offensives in the no-go areas so no one could take aid to the victims or tell the world what it was doing. I went 30 times to the no-go areas 
and Khartoum did not love me. They gave me a prison sentence for illegal entry. I said, well, stop calling them illegal. You shouldn't be. The people there need aid. They need advocacy. So make them legal, and I shan't have to come in illegally. But um, while you do, I'll have to come illegally. They then said they'd shoot our planes out of the sky. Well, we did have brave pilots who would give a false destination, fly around in the legit areas, and then snuck down to the forbidden areas. And we went, because we had to, to take aid to the victims, to get the evidence to tell the world what was going on. Scorched earth policy across the whole of southern Sudan, that's southern Blue Nile. Little lad and all that remains of his church, and slavery as a weapon of jihad, as it has been over the centuries. The objectives, quite explicitly, I went once to Khartoum to meet the leadership, we'd have to hear both sides, and they were quite explicit about their policies of Islamization and Arabization. I took this picture. You shouldn't have to take a picture like this in our day. There's women and children returning from slavery. Thousands were taken into slavery, but there were peaceable Arab Muslims from the north who were friends of the African Dinka people, did what they could to find and buy back and bring back women and children who'd been enslaved. Of course, they needed money. We gave them money for freedom, and we were criticized for so-called encouraging the slave trade. There's nothing more fallacious. It was not economic slavery. This was slavery as a weapon of war. They'd have been taken as slaves, whatever happened. And I think I have a mandate to set the captive free. I was there when the slave raids were going on. It was in this particular village. And one night from when I was there, the local tribal chief received a message. It was a letter, and it was signed by a general and a major of the government of Sudan army. That's the official army from Khartoum. It began, Salam Alaikum, then it went on, you fools, we're a force of 1,800 strong, we're coming to Niamlal at um, 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, you better be ready, Masalama. Well, I didn't sleep very well that night. In the event, the raiders went to a neighboring village, and the casualties started coming in. This brave guy tried to stop them taking a boy as a slave. He was shot in the face at point-blank range. All his joy is sheared away. Nothing we could do in the bush for that tried to get the Red Cross to come and do a casualty evacuation. They wouldn't, they couldn't. It was a no-go area. So we chartered a plane we couldn't afford and evacuated the casualties to Kenya. That poor man died four days later, but hope in less pain than in the bush. The others were safely returned. But the slavery was massive and heartbreaking. Little Deng has just returned with one of the traders. He's looking sad because he's just learnt that in the raid when he'd been captured, both his parents had been killed. So he's just discovered he is an orphan. But towards the end of my time, a little Deng got a wistful little smile. Well, at least I'm home again now. I'm called my own name Deng, which is the Dinka word for rain, and rain is precious, so it means someone to be cherished. He said, I'm no longer called a beat or the Arabic for slave. My friends, it's my contention every child should have an identity be cherished. None should be slave in the world today but still at least 27 million people enslaved around the world today, and many thousands still in Sudan. When I met the president of the new nation of Sudan, I said, Mr. President, what's your priority for advocacy? He said, please, will you keep drawing attention to my people who are still enslaved? I have such a problem trying to keep any kind of peace going and dealing with all the political challenges. Slavery is an issue too far for me, but please, will you remind the world of my people who are enslaved today? A peace agreement was signed in 2005, brought some peace for the South. A referendum for independence and celebration of independence was held. Massive mandate, celebration of the birth of the new nation on July the 9th, 2011. As I'd been there 30 times during the war, um, I was invited as a guest of the government to a front row to see the celebrations. But it was a time of glory and grey. The celebrations were tangible, ebullient, but the wars continue. The new Republic of South Sudan needs all the help it can get. Celebrating freedom and independence, yes. Here I was in Juba, the capital of the new, the new nation, and here is a clock with a countdown to the moment of independence. The celebrations in the streets, the raising of the flag of the world's newest nation, tangible joy, and the celebrations. But the challenges, Humanitarian jihad goes on, humanitarian crises and conflicts in the so-called marginal lands which are now in the north or now in the Republic of Sudan. They continue. We've got partners in heart in all these areas. 
President Omar al-Bashir of the Republic of Sudan, wanted by the International Criminal Court, responsible for those two million deaths and four million displaced in the previous war, has now said he intends to make the Republic of Sudan, that's the old north, into an Arabic Islamic nation with hard line Sharia law. It's going to matter to us if they do that, and matter to his people too. The people of the Nuba Mountains have recently suffered military offensives. Horrendous. We've got partners there. We get the news firsthand. 70,000 have fled their homes, many living in caves. These are recent pictures. Hiding in the caves. There are deadly snakes in those caves. But the people say to us, we fear the bombs more than we fear the snakes. And they still smile. They'll always smile. The casualties, the deaths, the snakes. Khartoum's military forces have also recently attacked Blue Nile with aerial bombardment. I know the commander, the governor of Blue Nile, is a great friend of mine, a brave man. He actually is a Muslim, but he is a Muslim who hates Islamism and wants freedom for his people, and he's a great friend. But they're having a horrendous time with aerial bombardment, and 400,000 have fled, either into other parts of South Sudan or Blue Nile. As we leave Sudan, two little faces, despair or hope, the future of Sudan and South Sudan on a knife edge. Please watch and see what your American administration does. If there is an attempt to bring about democracy in the North, if there is such an attempt, I think it deserves all the support it can get. The people there have suffered too much for too long. Very briefly, Nigeria. Much of Nigeria, prosperous and peaceful. The North, already Sharia law in 12 states, and Plateau State on the front line of a lot of killings. A combination of military jihad, demographic jihad, to achieve political control of Nigeria. These are two strategic front lines. South Sudan is the border between the north of Africa and sub-Saharan Africa. El Tarabi, the Islamist uh, guru in Khartoum, has said South Sudan is his iron curtain. If he could break South Sudan, he'd have militant Islam all the way to Cape Town. Nigeria is really the gateway to West Africa, is also targeted. The fighting, the intercommunal conflict, this is, we've been there every year, we've got partners, we're working out there in heart, trying to help the people with aid and advocacy. But many already killed this year, Christians killed in northern Nigeria this year already, many hundreds. This is Bauchi State, they'll still worship even in the ruins. Dogonahawa, a village outside Dross in Plateau State, I was there last year, Christian village, 450 Christians just killed in one night. Do we ever get to hear about it? The media are not really interested in Christian persecution. Inevitable post-traumatic stress. The children have to play by a grave where their parents, their siblings, their friends are buried. This is Dross in Plateau State, taken very recently. The machete wounds. This home, the man there looking so desolate, his pregnant wife and four children died in that home. His pregnant wife in there was with the children and as the jihad warriors came, shouting their jihad slogans, she tried to protect her youngest child lying on top of him. She was pregnant, and another child clung to her. The other child ran out. They killed the child who ran out with a machete, and they set fire to the home. The others perished inside. This is going on in our day. But worship and faith continue. A Catholic church burnt, but worship goes on. The Anglican church, the university church in Dross in Plateau State. Do we ever hear about this? So we've already seen that one. One of the evangelical churches. This is violence this year, the Bishop of Bauchi, one of his churches in Bauchi State, one of the Church of Nigerian churches. An invitation to an event that would never take place, and a hymn book. Now aid, they plead for aid. Heart is working with our friends there, and it doesn't actually take megabucks. You do not need 29 million US dollars. It costs 5,000 pounds to build a primary healthcare clinic. That's about 8,000 US dollars. And the people are so cheerful, they will always smile. Archbishop Ben is one of our partners there in Dross in Plateau State, his lovely wife Gloria. They've tried to kill him two or three times. They've had to run out of their house, set a light with their children on their shoulders but they still smile. But as we move towards a conclusion, as we look out to the wider world, because we're all part of the same small world, Archbishop Ben gave us this challenge when we saw him recently. If we here in Nigeria have a faith worth living for, 
It is a faith worth dying for. Don't you, that's us, compromise the faith that we are living and dying for. We in Britain are compromising that faith. We've allowed Sharia law into Britain. He also said, if you don't resist now, your grandchildren are going to have to fight the battles. You do not have the courage to fight. That's a challenge for us. What to do? Islam, as I've tried to indicate, is thinking strategically in every sphere, humanitarian, economic, legal, political, you name it. Christianity in particular, and the West in general, we're not thinking strategically. Without compromising our democratic principles, it is time to draw a line in the sand and to say, enough is enough. We have inherited our freedoms. We have a precious legacy for which people have died. We have an obligation to pass that on. So we must draw the lines in the sand. The bill in Parliament, my private member's bill, is one way. We're trying to do that in the UK in Parliament. No to compromises, Sharia finance and banking. Protect academic freedom. Ensure that Islamic funding doesn't compromise staff appointments and teaching in any education institution. There's a good organization in Britain, Center for Social Cohesion, published a very good report with a clever title, Degrees of Influence. It speaks for itself. Christianity in particular, the West in general, must regain holistic mission. As I've said, Islam is pouring money into developing countries, building a mosque, a school, a clinic. Christianity used to build a church, a school, a clinic. Without a vision, the people perish. So conclusion, those who value freedom must wake up, look out, think strategically to counter the advances being made in so many areas by Islam. Otherwise, irreversible ground will be lost. It'll be very hard to get it back. And we will fail in our responsibility to pass on undiminished our spiritual, cultural, and political heritage to our children and our grandchildren. And my final slide. Sometimes when we look around the world, whether it's hard in our humanitarian work or in its political arena, we've been thinking about tonight. The issues are so vast. The problems are so huge, you don't know where to begin. So sometimes you may just shrug your shoulders, feel paralyzed, and not begin at all. But we must provide authentic visions and commitments, a balanced appraisal of our history, including appreciation of what is good in our political, cultural, and spiritual heritage, vibrant, convincing role models, engagement with those who are suffering persecution, informed prayer and advocacy, and this is our motto, okay, I cannot do everything, but I must not do nothing. And if together we all do do something, we really can make a difference for freedom, for our nations, for the world. Thank you for letting me share a little bit of the pain and the passion. Thank you, Baroness Cox. Uh, it's a privilege to hear from you. We now have the joy of uh, a few minutes of uh, Q&A. If you'd like to ask a Q, the microphone uh, is at the back. Uh, and there's currently no Q. I mean, no line. I'm sorry, I forgot. There's no line. So if you'd like to be at the head of the Q. Uh, and uh, we've got about 20 minutes of questions. Keep, this is very important for Socrates and the City purposes. Um, keep your question in the form of a question. <laughs> and please keep it as short as possible so we can get to a few of them. Thank you. Baroness, I was deployed to Iraq in 2009 and had the odd experience of reading Democracy in America there and thinking what, how sad it was that we have this great culture and this is how we're defending it. I mean, do you see our wars that way? I fought with British people over there. How do you look at those wars that we're in now, Afghan and Iraq, Afghanistan and Iraq? Mm -hmm. Thank you for a very challenging question. I will answer it very briefly. It's not my primary area of expertise, but I will say two things. One is, 
In Britain, I did actually vote in Parliament for taking that military action in Iraq because I'd been in northern Iraq. Um, I'd been with the Kurds who had suffered the chemical warfare at Halabja. And it was widely believed then that um, Saddam Hussein did actually have those chemical weapons, weapons of mass destruction, and there was no reason to think he wouldn't necessarily use them again. So I felt that was justified. I think the great problem and the great tragedy was that when war started and was fought with fairly clinical precision, but there's no exit strategy. And I think that was the big political and strategic failure in that situation. So we do have an obligation, I think, to defend the vulnerable and that we have the freedom, we have the resources so to do. Um, but I think we have to do it with appropriate sensitivity and the political follow through, which we did not do properly in Iraq. And that is a great tragedy. But may I just say one other thing? I was speaking at an interfaith conference in Paris not so long ago, and there were some ladies from Iraq there. And they, um, I've been speaking about Islam. May I just say, first of all, I went up to them and said, I gave a kind of talk I've given this evening, which is fairly hard hitting in its, well, you've heard it. And I said, I do hope I haven't offended you ladies. And they were obviously devout Muslims with their hijabs and from Iraq. And they said, no, we are so grateful to you. So everyone who went before you, and we had lots of lovely contributions on interfaith dialogues. I'm not against interfaith dialogues, provided they're well founded. And it's not just a question of Christians apologizing and Muslims agreeing, which a lot of interfaith dialogues are. But and, you know, I'm in favor of interfaith dialogues. But it had all been positive stuff until I stood up and felt I had to raise the uncomfortable questions. And they said, we're so grateful. They said, no, everyone up till now hasn't said anything that mattered at all. And you're the only speaker who's had the courage to mention Sharia. And we hate Sharia. And I got to know them very well. It was a two-day conference. We formed a little group. They called me their very own baroness. And then they said, you know, we're so grateful. For, what, for the West intervening in Iraq. We never understand why the BBC keeps on covering all the problems, why they don't cover all the people with body parts missing. It happened while Saddam Hussein was still here. And we are grateful. So I think it's a complex picture. Um, it's a very difficult, with, the, with retrospective hindsight, whether or not he did have weapons of mass destruction. It was believed he did. And I'd been with the Kurds. I'd seen what he'd done with those weapons of mass destruction to his own people. So I think the decision was absolutely understandable and justifiable. The, it can't go into all the wars in the world today. As one example, I would take, each one must be considered on its own merits. But I would just say one thing. I sometimes wonder, when all the body bags come back to Britain, and they come back, obviously, to your country, um, this is, in Afghanistan, a war dealing very much with Islamic issues and with Islamic extremism in the Taliban. I'm not quite sure what other so-called moderate Muslim nations are doing. Where are their soldiers helping in that situation? And what do they feel when we are the ones who see our body bags coming back? I think it's a question that ought to be asked a bit more. Why are they not doing more in terms of peacekeeping, in terms of promoting the moderate Islam that they seem to be wanting to tell the world they represent? I think there's a bit of a challenge there, and I'd like to see our governments ask that question a bit more. Why are we paying the price so massively? for what is really an intra-Islamic issue. Baroness, would you um, describe the relationship or lack thereof between Sharia law and the Quran? Sharia law and? The Quran. The Quran. The elements of Sharia law which you can uh, find rooted very much in what's called the Hadith, which are the kind of teachings, and the Quran. And I'm going to say something about uh, the present state of Islamic teaching and why there are so many aspects which do cause us concern. If you enter into interfaith dialogues or see some of our Muslim leaders on television, they will always quote the, the verses or the surahs of peace, and they sound lovely. And no one can take any exception to those. They are, are irenic and would be very compatible with any other peaceful faith tradition. But there are also the verses of the sword. Now, one of the issues to do with understanding contemporary Islam, or historic traditional Islam, is that that's obviously a contradiction. But Allah cannot be inherently self-contradictory. So traditional orthodox teaching resolved the contradiction between the verse of peace and the verses of a sword by saying and teaching that the later revelations of the prophet abrogate the earlier revelations to the prophet. Now, unfortunately for all of us, the later revelations of the prophet 
are the revelations of the sword. And so the later revelations by the principle of abrogation actually override the earlier revelations. And so much of the more hardline and the more militant teachings which are there in the Quran are the later revelations. And we do need to understand that principle of abrogation. And if anyone is going into interfaith dialogues, we do need to understand that. Because our Muslim friends' interfaith dialogues will always quote the verses of peace, and they are in the Quran, quite true, but orthodox Islamic teaching is based on the principle of abrogation, which is the much harder line and much more militant uh, interpretations of the Quran. So, does that make some sense? If anyone's interested, I, may, I have actually brought out a book of my colleague John Marks, uh, which does deal with all these kind of issues, and there are some copies that are available. Very happy to make them available, and it would answer your question very directly. Hi, Baroness. Uh, I want to thank you for your insightful uh, dis discussion here tonight. Um, I recently got back from, from living in Paris for three and a half years. And, living um, in? Paris. Mm -hmm. um, and... As you know, uh, President Sarkozy passed a bill banning the niqab. Um, recently, there was a bombing of the headquarters of Charlie Hebdo, uh, a weekly uh, cartoon magazine. Um, my only issue with your thesis is simply that there is a rise of both extremism on the right and the left. Um, as you know, in uh, the UK with the EDL. Um, and so my concern is only, what is your um, opinion or your voice towards the, moder uh, mm -hmm. the moderate, towards the middle. Um, so that way we don't see sort of mm -hmm. a, uh, a large, uh, an explosion on the right or the left. Well, thank you for an important question. It doesn't mean the others weren't important, <laughs> but thank you. I think one of the reasons why I'm very keen to develop this parliamentary initiative with this private members bill, looking at gender discrimination in Sharia law, is because a lot of people are getting very worried about the kind of things we're talking about tonight, about the growth of Islam and the way in which it is actually using the various freedoms of democracy. And Middle England, I call it that, you know, sort of, I don't mean geographically, but British people, there is a lot of worry out there. And quite a few people are wondering whether or not they should join one of the more extremist parties, the English League for Democracy or the, or the National Front, or the BNP, which is the modern version of the National Front, because no one else in the center seems to be taking these issues seriously. So I hope that by introducing this uh, private members bill, we can get serious, responsible, sensitive discussion in the heart of parliament, so people will know we actually are addressing these issues, so there won't be any need for them to join one of the more extreme groups, and I hope thereby will prevent precisely the kind of polarization that you're talking about. I'm afraid if we don't have this responsible discussion and have these issues out in the open and address them seriously, then there will be that polarization. At the moment in Britain, um, it's a bit like the elephant in the, in the middle of the room. You know, nobody talks about this subject. It's a huge subject. And you know, people just are frightened of talking about it. We've got to shatter the silence. We've got to break the barrier of fear of intimidation, you've got to start talking about these issues. And I think if we start talking about them, then we can, I hope, get moderate and generally um, democratic and tolerant ways of drawing lines in the sand before it is too late, before it polarizes, or before we've lost too much in the way of our fundamental freedoms. Make sense? Baroness, thank you so much for your, um, your amazing talk tonight. I really appreciate it. And I'm wondering, with regards to the, um, the Muslim women in Britain who you discussed being subject to Sharia law, can you explain what recourse, if any, they have to British law, or are they sort of locked into Sharia law? Thank you very much. Um, the British government at the moment is not looking favorably on my draft member's bill. Um, because they say there's no need for it because every citizen in the United Kingdom has access to uh, the British legal system. So they've all technically got a right to redress but the reality is and anyone who knows anything about the reality knows that that is actually a, a fiction that a lot of these women do not de facto they may have it um, de jure they legally got access to it but de facto they don't there's enormous intimidation in very closed communities and there is a book for example that was written in Britain um, it's called The Imam's Daughter and it's a true story and I know the person who ghost wrote it and he is a very good author, and he's traveled with me, and I respect him 100%. He's a very honorable uh, guy. So I believe that story. 
And people who know this woman know it's a true story. And it's a horrendous story about how she's an imam's daughter. From the age of seven, she was abused and raped in the cellar of their home, and the mother was beaten and couldn't do anything to protect the daughter. And it's a heartbreaking story. And in the end, she managed to escape. Now, she is still in hiding in Britain today. People shouldn't have to be in hiding in Britain today. She suffered appallingly, but that community was out to, actually, they came at one stage as a mob to kill her, and she just managed to escape that. She is still afraid of death. So when you have that kind of intimidation in a country like Britain, things have already gone too far, and we have to open things up so people do know that they do have legal a redress, and two provisions in my draft bill, or my proposed bill, um, would address that situation. One, um, it would give victims of violence, domestic violence, the women of domestic violence, the automatic right of police protection. They wouldn't have to ask for it. Therefore, they wouldn't be subject to the pressure of the community to stop them bringing shame on the community. The police would have a right to intervene and provide that protection once they, it became known to the authorities that they were subject to domestic abuse. And the other provision in the bill which might address that situation is there would be a statutory obligation on any authorities coming into contact with these women, like social workers, um, community health nurses, police to make sure every woman knows her rights. The moment many of them are incarcerated, isolated, marginalized, and vulnerable. So there's a two provisions in the bill which might help to put that situation right, to change the technicality into reality. But intimidation will still be very real, it's still a problem. Uh, yes. Good evening, Baroness. Uh, first, a statistic, and please correct my numbers if they're not right. 1970, Great Britain, 700,000 Muslims. Uh, today, five million, correct? Yeah, thank you. I didn't know uh, about the first figure, but the second I can endorse, yes. Uh, which brings to mind might it's right. Uh, number two, uh, I think that being a conservative, and if I'm not mistaken again, uh, you voted for legalizing drugs, right? Is that? Did I? I read it in, on the website. By the way, Okay. And, and if, 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 if it's Wikipedia, don't believe everything on that. <laughs> well, I thought it was a touch of libertarianism. Thank you. What, what was your question? What was your first well, question? Uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, I was trying to find out if uh, that, uh, that's true or not. That's all. I have to check my records. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll check it out and let you know. I don't um, remember so doing. We just, we just have I want to make sure that Joe Lacanti and Ann Morse get to ask the question. I'll keep my uh, answer so, short. So keep this very brief, please, just because we, yeah. we want to get out on time. They need this room for a Scientology thing in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Baroness. My concern is that we don't understand. As I was coming here from Queens, I realized I was passing Muslim neighborhood after neighborhood. And I realize we don't understand what is growing up around us, what has gone on from so many years in England and America and other places and the price of freedom. I, don't, I think we need a whole new movement on understanding what freedom and liberty is and the price we need to pay for it. Could you speak for that? Mm, thank you. That's why I cherish Socrates in the city. It's the beginning of that movement. <laughs> A previous um, question asked, or partially answered, well, you answered uh, his question, which was the same as mine. My question has to do with um, how much respect do the Sharia courts have in the British legal system? If, if, some, if a Muslim woman is divorced through these courts, can she, does she have uh, access to um, the British courts to overturn? Uh, who set these things up? Was it just... <laughs> They, they happen, they happen without any parliamentary debate, any sort of public discussion. So I mean, they're happening in the United States, I'm led to believe. So you do need to be aware they're happening here. As far as the particular position, the women, they um, receive uh, benefits, uh, financial benefits from the state as single parents, single mothers. So they do get financial benefits. Um, but that, of course, raises another whole issue. Baroness Cox, it's terrific to see you again. Thank you for a terrific talk. Uh, I have a question about Scientology for you there. No, no, just kidding. I'm just kidding. 
Uh, you know better than most of us in this room that this idea of liberal democracy, equal justice under the law, it's not really an American idea, is it? It's really, it's a British idea. It's John Locke. So how is it that this country that gave this great gift to the Western world, liberal democracy, equal justice under the law, seems to be willing to let it go? Can you give us some kind of warning signs that mm -hmm. we need to watch out for here on this side of the pond? Well, thank you. I tried to indicate that at the very beginning by saying how our values have been undermined by the onslaught of Marxism, Leninism, and all the sort of followed from that of our loss of values, a loss of appreciation of anything we have that's precious in our political and cultural heritage, the extreme relativism and the multiculturalism taken to um, ad absurdium. So those are the ingredients why we got to where we are. Um, and maybe you can stop the United States developing into that kind of morass of valueless vulnerability, which is what it really is. Um, I think as far as your own country is concerned, I think there may be a lot happening here. I'll just give you two brief examples of food for thought as you go on your way, to leave you really uncomfortable. One was upstate New York. I was there earlier this year, and I'm not even going to mention where it was because I don't want anyone to get into trouble. But there was a school teacher who told me how one of the pupils in his school, and this is in your state, uh, came to him and said, you're one of the lucky ones. School teacher said to pupil, teenager, oh, what do you mean? And he said, well, you're going to be given a choice. And a school teacher to pupil, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you're going to be given a choice between becoming a Muslim and and um, then the school lad, I mean, the teacher you know, was nice to the lad. He thought he probably needed a bit of help and was pastoral. And the boy said to him, you know, I could tell you an awful lot more, but I'd get into trouble if I did. This is your state. So, you know, beware. In Tennessee, I had a meeting recently, was it, um, met with, back in London, they came over to Britain particularly, um, a group of senators from Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee, the middle of what I believe you call your Bible Belt in the States, deeply worried that Tennessee is being targeted. This is their, their version, not mine. So you know, I'm not putting words or having hallucinations. They came to me with this concern because they felt that if um, strategic or political Islam could actually get a hold in Tennessee, at the middle of your sort of Bible belt, they would weaken probably the strongest area of resistance of the whole United States. And apparently there are a lot of uh, politically, strategically active Muslims in Tennessee. They've really built a huge mosque. They've got their madrasas. And they are beginning to do the kind of things that uh, we are already experiencing in the UK. And some of them have been um, sent to live in Tennessee by UNHCR. They are refugees from Somalia, but they are extremely politically active and astute um, new citizens of Tennessee. So I think, you know, just all I will say is I've been able and privileged, thanks to Socrates and the city, to share with you some of the pain, some of the passion, some of the deep, deep concerns about the, trying to resist uh, these onslaughts on our fundamental freedoms. I think Britain and Europe are far further gone uh, than the United States. You can learn from our experiences, but please do learn and act. <laughs> Don't learn and then realize too late that you've lost ground that you could have preserved. So thank you for the privilege of sharing that with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Baroness Cox.